present here and, and worshiping God. Uh, my name is Ed Rüdiger, and I feel really fortunate and blessed to be leading you in worship in this drop-down, gorgeous church. I mean, I don't know if you could see it, but they got, man, they got everything decorated up here, and it looks really, really good. So, welcome in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, let's have, are there any announcements? We, there are a few people here. Uh, s say something together. So the people that are maybe watching know that I'm not all by myself. Merry Christmas! So see, there you go. We, we got some folks here. So do you all have anything that you need to share about what's coming up in the next couple of weeks? I hear there's a holiday in about a week and a half. There is a holiday yeah. in a week and a half. Okay. Uh, actually, longer. A little longer. Yeah, a week and a half is about right. Okay. Well... Then, then let's worship God together. Let me say a, a, just a brief prayer to, to sort of kick us off. Lord God, you are present here because you are present with us all the time. And man, we are, we are forever grateful. Uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to, to worship together. Even if we're not here in person, we are connecting online. And that's really exciting that you've given us a chance to do that. Uh, guide us. Inspire us. Help us to feel the joy of this really sacred season. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Now, our call to worship is the 123rd Psalm. If you've got Bibles at home with you, you might want to open up and, and read along. Hear now the word of God as written by the psalmist. To you I lift up my eyes, O you who are enthroned in the heavens. As the eyes of the servant look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God until he has mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, O Lord, have mercy upon us, for we have had a more than enough contempt. Our soul has been, has been more than its fill of the scorn of those who are at ease and the contempt of the proud. Brothers and sisters, as God's people, let's worship him together. Now, Kathy, would you then light the uh, Advent candles? Advent, look up in the sky, and the Word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. The subject of our ministry is Jesus Christ, the Word who was from the beginning with God and was made flesh to live among us. To be a Christian is to witness to the Word, to reveal the presence of His Word within us, as well as among us. Look up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. I will never forget those opening words from the television show Superman. I was a young boy when I first got caught up in the stories surrounding the Man of Steel. Our family didn't have a television. And so every Friday evening, the neighbor would invite us over to watch Ozzy and Harriet first, and then Superman. Why am I remembering all this now? I think it's because I'm not a child anymore, and my hero has changed. He's not a fantasy to me. He's for real. He's Jesus Christ. Now, during Advent, I'm still drawn to look up in the sky to remember and give thanks for angels singing about peace that came to earth in the form of a child who was and is Christ the Lord. Let us pray. Dear God, I know that during wartime, Superman was a fantasy figure created to help our country dream of peace. But as Christmas, you opened up the heavens to show the world peace in a very real hero named Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. 
Thank you, Kathy. Now, Kathy, do you happen to know who wrote that little little thing? Yeah. Henry J. M. Newen, N-O-U-W-E-N. Henry. Okay, because it, that was it was very nice. I'll tell you, I was taken just a little bit aback when you said when I was a boy. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I was thinking, whoa, there's there's more revelation occurring than than I feel comfortable with here. Uh, but that was a that was a one. I thought I think a particularly nice nice reading. So thank you so much. As we prepare ourselves to hear God's word read and proclaimed and go on with the service, it's appropriate that we go to God in prayer. And uh, in, as we go to God in prayer, we, we confess our sins. And confession is just a recognition of things that we probably should have done better. And so that's what we're going to do right now. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open and I'm going to pray for a little bit. And then there'll be a time of silence and you can then lift your own prayers to God. And uh, we'll close with an assurance of pardon and the, the Gloria. So, brothers and sisters, as God's people, let's go to God now in prayer. Lord God, as we said a little bit earlier, we are so grateful to be here, to be gathered in your name. Now, as we prepare ourselves to uh, hear your word read and proclaim there's, there's something that, that we need to confess. There's something that we need to, to recognize. Yet sometimes in, in our lives, we tend to focus our attention on ourselves. Uh, we, we see ourselves as the center of the universe, and in a way we are the center of our own universe, but as we uh, approach you and others, we tend to view ourselves maybe as a little more important than we are. Now, that's harmless by and large as we deal with others, and we pay consequences when it's not as harmless. But when we approach you and, and when we share your good news, that can become really destructive. Because as that wonderful little devotion we heard a while, just a few seconds ago about, about a genuine hero, Jesus Christ, our focus needs to be on him. Uh, it needs to be on, on his birth. It needs to be on his message. It needs to be on his sacrifice. It needs to be on his triumphal resurrection. We need to focus on him and not on ourselves. So, Lord God, when we do focus our attention on, on who we are rather than who you are, we ask for your forgiveness and for your grace. And, and maybe even more than that, we ask that you help us redirect that attention so we can truly see what's most important. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And now in the, the privacy of our own hearts, we're going to go to you in prayer. We're going to lift up to you those things that weigh heavy on us. Lord, hear us as we pray. Thank you. Thank you for listening to us and, and thank you for loving us as much as you do. But right now, we thank you for forgiving us. And we, we know we've been forgiven. In fact, you've cleansed us. That's what you've promised. And we know that because we've lifted these, these prayers. We've confessed these sins in the name of Christ our Savior. In his name we now pray. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, hear the good news of the gospel. This saying is sure and worthy of universal acceptance, that Jesus Christ came to save sinners. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might be dead to sin and alive to all that's good. Brothers and sisters, believe the good news of the gospel in Jesus Christ. Our sins are forgiven. Amen. Amen. Let's sing the Gloria.
outstanding. And I'll tell you, as we're approaching Christmas, you know, moving through Advent, it just wouldn't seem right not to sing some Christmas carols, right? We, we need to, to be singing. That's part of worship during Advent. And so what, what we're going to do is we're going to play uh, away, you're going to play away in the manger. And how about if we also sing away in the manger? Would that be okay? Okay, so you're going to play it and we're going to sing it. And y'all know this one so well. Man, it's maybe the first Christmas carol we learned as little kids. So let's all sing together, even if you don't have the words in front of you. Let's all sing together away in, the, in a manger. good let's give ourselves a round of applause we did it and I like that I like that middle part Thank you. that was really that that seemed to make it work so I appreciate that quite a bit now we're, we're at the part of the service when we have the opportunity to lift our concerns to God uh, I'm looking at the the folks here in in front of me are there any particular needs this congregation has that y'all might want to share that we might want to remember. I do have a concern. Yes. The notifications up here, I see where it says, oh, we must have started, I must have put this on, and it must have started a little bit late. And someone said, uh, who is the pastor today? So would you introduce yourself again? So well, I'm, I'm very shy. So introducing myself is... I, I know that. <laughs> well, well that's that's good rather than it's that guy you know it's him uh, but my name is Ed Rudiger and I'm a, a minister here in the area and uh, just feel incredibly privileged to be worshiping with you to, uh, this morning so that's who I am uh, and maybe I need prayer too That'll be, <laughs> we'll make that a fair request as well. Are there any other needs we want to we wanna consider? For all the shut-ins, all the people that yeah. don't have anybody to visit them and so on, we pray for them today. You know, this is a, a I'm going, so glad you mentioned it because this is yeah. such, a, such a horrible time with this, with this virus. It, it really is. Uh, you know, I've, I was talking to a person last week whose brother, and, and my wife, who's sitting over there, knows who I'm talking about. Uh, brother passed uh, just in the past, past week or so. And this, this virus has, has changed the way people die. And he, he had cancer, so it wasn't COVID-related, but he died alone. Uh, you know, his, his sister, and they were twins. His sister was able to have contact with him before. And even when he passed, was sort of connected as we are, you know, electronically. 
but he was alone. And, and I think we need to pray for all those, whether it's related, whether it's COVID-related deaths, and my gosh, what, 3,000 in a week? I mean, we, we talk about horrendous numbers now. Uh, it's, it's very hard on families and for the people who are ill to be so isolated. So thank you so much. Uh, we need to remember those who are, who are shut in and are feeling really isolated. And, and families during this Christmas season that are not uh, able to spend time together. Uh, I think we need to, to remember those, those folks in our, in our prayers. Well, with, uh, with those in mind and also those things we know within our own heart, let's go to God now in prayer. And I'm going to pray for a little bit. And then you all have the opportunity to lift your prayers to God. You can do that out loud at home or you can do it silently. That's, that's totally up to you. Uh, and then we'll close by uh, praying the Lord's Prayer. So, brothers and sisters, as God's people, let's go before him now in prayer. Again, Lord, we thank you for giving us a chance to be together. Uh, now, this third time I've said it, and I may say it again in a prayer, because it's something we, we forget upon occasion, just how special it is to, to gather in your name. And, and Lord, you've given us now the technology to connect. Even if we're not present physically, we can connect electronically. And uh, that's something we couldn't have done, we couldn't have done. Uh, 10 years ago, but we can do it today. So we thank you for these advancements that help us stay together as a community during these, these very, very trying times. Uh, now, Lord, as we approach you in prayer and lift our needs up to you, uh, we do need to remember all those who are shut in, who are feeling particularly isolated, uh, whether it's because you're fa they're facing an illness, a serious illness right now, or, or whether they're in a nursing home or uh, assisted living place that's becoming more, become more and more isolated, or, or just folks who are afraid and are, are self-quarantining because they're concerned about going out and doing the things they would normally do, especially this time of year. Lord, be with those families. Uh, be with those individuals who are feeling alone because they just don't, can't experience the warmth of another human being close. Be with those f folks and families who are frustrated because, because they want to reach out and hug loved ones uh, and just aren't able to do it. Uh, and be with families this time of year who have year after year after year going home for Christmas, but now are going to be separated. Uh, be with us all and remind us of, of two things that are, that are really, really important. Remind us that what we're enduring right now is going to pass. Uh, it's, it's not going to be this way forever. Sometimes it feels that way, but it's not. Uh, remind us of that before we give up hope and, uh, and become so frustrated we become sour to the world around us. This is, this is going to end. That's one thing to remind us, to help us remember. And, and second, remind us that you are in charge. It's not us. It's not viruses. It's not presidents. It's not congresses. It's not governors. They aren't in charge, ultimate charge. You are. And, and remind us, because you're in charge, you're going to get us through this uh, and help us claim the opportunities that this, this trying period are laying before us. Lord God, hear us as we lift these prayers to you. In the name of Christ, we pray. And now in the privacy of our own hearts, we're going to lift up to you the needs that we know so well. Uh, we're also going to lift up the needs of, of our community and our family and our friends. Lord God, hear us as we pray.
Thank you, Lord. Thank you for listening to us, and we know that you do. And thank you for loving us, and we know that you love us as well. But right now, thank you for responding to our needs. And we know that you'll do that as well. Because we've offered up these needs in the name of Christ our Savior, who taught us to pray, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now I understand we got a, we got a treat, right? A, a special treat because we've got a Christmas carol medley. And it's not just a medley, it's a sing-along melody. So when you hear those uh, carols that you know so well, sing, sing along. And I'll tell you, since you're at home, especially y'all who are not surrounded by anybody else, nobody else there, sing as loud as you want. Okay, we're going to have a uh, a, a four-carol medley that we're going to do. One verse only, the first verse. All songs that you all know out there, so we expect you guys to sing, sort of to drown me out, because I'm going to leave this. <laughs> what we're going to do is we're going to take you through a little, a little uh, story of the of the Christmas uh, happening. First, we're going to go to Bethlehem, where our Lord and Savior was born. Then we're going to go out into the fields with the shepherds, and then we're going to go and traverse with the three wise men, and then we're going to finish up. Uh, with the angels glorifying the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So it's one verse of little a town of Bethlehem, one verse of while shepherds watched their flocks by night, one verse of three, we three kings of Orient are, and one verse of angels we have heard on high. Okay. <laughs>
was really, really good. You, you, you said drowned out. You were talking about people drowning out your singing. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> I don't think you need to be drowned out. I think that sounded pretty good. And, and you, again, did a, did a great job. Now, uh, this is a time in the service when we would present an offering to you. Hey, I, I, I've got a suggestion. I got a suggestion. You know, people don't, uh, may not realize this, maybe, maybe you do, but even when the church isn't gathered in worship, there are, it, there are expenses. Hi, how are you doing? I'm glad to be back Sorry. again. Uh, no, no, that's no problem. I, I'll tell you what, what we could call that is you gave them a break because they didn't have to look at me uh, for, for just a couple of minutes. You know, churches still are doing, fun, are still functioning. Uh, you, electricity has got to be paid. Heat's got to be paid. We're gathered here this morning in churches that have ministers. You know, the ministers are still doing the best they can to address the needs of not just the con their congregations, but also their communities. The, the church still has needs. And so uh, during this, this offering time, and I'm going to uh, say a little prayer over it, uh, but this is, this is to give you the opportunity to get out your checkbooks, if you want, and to write a little check and put it in an envelope and send it to be nice to send it to Mingo. If you're a member here, if you're a member of another church, you send it to your church. Uh, because this is not about just about the church. It's about you making an offering to God, giving to God a portion of what he's given you. So I'm going to encourage you to do that. If you were into electronics, which, which I kind of am, uh, you might want to go to your, your bank and, and send an electronic transfer or send a, a check through your bank. Uh, if your church accepts other payments like PayPal or Venmo, you might want to use One that as well. Going, Pastor, is that they can either send it to Church 650 or Fifth Avenue or Ina. Uh, some, some people take it over and put it in Ina's mailbox. They know where she lives. Okay. Because everybody knows where Ina lives. That's, that's, that's good. You know, I've, I've never been that popular that everybody knows where, where I live. <laughs> so you, you can do that. So now I'm assuming you have done it. Let's, let's have a word of prayer over this offering. Lord God, thank you so much for giving us the means, even in these trying, difficult times, giving us the means to lift our offering up to you. Help us to recognize that this is being used as best it can to serve you by this congregation. Guide and direct the leaders that it may continue to be so. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. And as we do after the offering, let's sing the doxology. Thank you. Y'all may be seated. Now, the, the scripture lesson this morning is from the Gospel according to John. Now, it's the lectionary reading from the Gospel for this third Sunday in Advent. Uh, and so, it, uh, it's from John. If you've got your Bibles with you, and, and that's a nice thing to, to have, you may want to read along. I'm going to be reading this from the contemporary English version. So hear now the word of God as written by the evangelist John. God sent a man named John who came to tell about the light and to lead people to have faith. John wasn't that light. He came only to tell about the light. The Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and temple helpers to ask John who he was. He told them plainly, I am not the Messiah. Then when they asked him if he were Elijah, he said, no, I am not. 
And when they asked him if he was a prophet, he also said no. Finally, they said, who are you then? We have to give an answer to the ones who sent us. Tell us who you are. John answered in the words of the prophet Isaiah. I am only someone shouting in the desert. Get the road ready for the Lord. Some Pharisees had also been sent to John. They asked him, why are you baptizing people if you're not the Messiah or Elijah or the prophet? John told them, I use water to baptize people. But here with you is someone you don't know. Even though I came first, I'm not good enough to untie his sandals. John said this as he was baptizing east of the Jordan River in Bethany. Amen. Amen. Praise God for this reading from his word. Let's have just a brief word of prayer together. Almighty God, inspire us now that the words we've heard and the words we're about to hear, that they may make a difference in the way we live. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, as, as we kind of try to navigate through this, this pandemic, I think it's really important for us to maintain as many of those old-fashioned Christmas traditions as we can. And you know, a lot of them we're able to do, even though there's kind of a virus raging out in our world. For example, COVID doesn't pre prevent us from decorating the house, right? We can still decorate. Doesn't stop us from baking Christmas pies and cakes or, or cookies. And in case y'all are, are wondering, for me, that's pumpkin pie, devil foods cake, and snickerdoodles. You can just file it away. Now, those are two things we're able to do. Just like we can still exchange gifts, right? And even though those gifts that we're exchanging, may, we may have bought them online instead of at the mall, you know, Christmas just wouldn't be the same if we didn't give them. I mean, how in heaven's name are we going to sing, I'll be home for Christmas, without presents by the tree? But you know, regardless of what's by our tree at home, and my wife is here, regardless of what ends up going there, for me it's going to fade in comparison with those Christmases back when I was a kid. You remember back when you were a kid? My goodness gracious, Christmas was almost magical back then. And I'll tell you, for me, my favorite gifts were the ones in the stockings. Now, they were by no means the big gifts in the Rudiger house. In fact, they were actually pretty small and, and generally un inexpensive. But I'll tell you what made them really important, what made them really special, at least to me, was that my dad picked out each and every one of them. And he picked them out just for my brother, sister, and I. And I got to tell you, because my dad did it, they were always clever and they were always appropriate. And I'll tell you, they always reflected his sense of humor. But... Because they were in our stockings, it was assumed, at least around the house, that they came from Santa Claus, right? They came from Santa Claus. And that became true, that assumption was true, even when we stopped hearing that silver bell ring. And I'll tell you, that's really important, because that's part of what made these gifts so special to me. Not only were they special in and of themselves, but because they, were, they came from Santa Claus, we weren't supposed to thank God, uh, God, yeah, we can thank God, but not Dad, for buying these really cool things. And I'll tell you something else, Dad never talked about why he decided to get what he decided to buy. Instead, my father was amazingly quiet as we took those gifts out of the stocking, as we opened them up, as he, he could see how excited and happy we were. Dad never said a word. Never claimed credit. Now for me, those were the best gifts 
I've ever received. And I'll tell you why I mention this. Sometimes we kind of end up directing, doing what my dad didn't do, we end up directing attention towards ourselves rather than towards the gifts that we give. In other words, we're not always real good at letting the gifts shine, sort of staying out of the way. You see, we kind of like to put the spotlight on ourselves. I know I, I do. And th when we do that, we kind of push those gifts that we give, we kind of push them over into the shadows. In other words, whether intentionally or not, we often make it about ourselves and not the gift itself. Now, I'm telling you, I got a gut feeling that's, that's sort of the way we are. That may be just the way we are as human beings. But, you know, we take that kind of attitude, this desire to be the focus of attention. This, we use this attitude and apply it to more than just the stuff we can wrap and put underneath the Christmas tree. You see, as Christians, I think we're constantly tempted to focus on ourselves rather than on the truth, the message that we share to the world, that God has given us to share to the world. And you know what gift I'm talking about. That good news we're called to announce. The child of Bethlehem, Jesus Christ. You see, we tend to focus, or we are tempted to focus our attention on us rather than on that. And I'll tell you, it all starts with some assumptions that people often make. For example, I think we often assume that being a witness to Jesus Christ, well, it's really about the dedication and the wisdom and the, the spiritual insight we show when we make the desire to do it. I mean, we've made this great decision. We're going to bear, bear witness. Man, God is ever lucky to have us on his side, right? That's an assumption we make. But that's not the only one because we also assume that it's actually about the way we decide to share the message. That's what's important. That's what we assume. Just like we assume that our ultimate success or failure, that belongs to us as well. You see, these are some assumptions that I think we tend to make as Christians bearing witness to Jesus Christ. And even though doing that kind of thing may have more to do with our humanity than anything else, when we give into this temptation, I think it says some real damage. You see, I think it distorts our relationship with God. Because when you get right down to it, as it relates to witness bearing, if we believe this, God really plays a secondary role. It's primarily about us. And not only that, I think it distorts our whole message. You know, that message that we're called to share. Because like any good salesman, I mean, as a good salesman, we are going to maximize the benefits. We're going to emphasize the benefits of membership, and we're going to minimize what? The cost, right? Now, I think that also happens. So the message that we're out there sharing becomes a little distorted. But maybe worse of all, this perspective can result in a false understanding of ourselves. Maybe a feeling of righteous arrogance when we feel we've been successful, when, when our witness takes root and people get excited about it. Or on the other side, some genuine spiritual shame when, we, when we're sure we haven't. You see, neither our lives nor our faith improves when we concentrate our attention on who we are rather than on what we have to give. And even though, like I said a minute ago, this may always be a direction we kind of drift as people, I also believe that we have it in our power to resist tempta this temptation and to focus not on ourselves, but rather on the good news that we've been given to share. And I'll tell you, I think we can do just that when we make the decision to remember three things that we can find in this passage and in the person of John the Baptist. And I'm going to share those three things with you right now. For example, first we can remember what God intends. 
In other words, we can remember that sharing the love and the mercy and the acceptance of Jesus Christ, man, that is actually grounded in the will of God, not just in a decision that I make. And like I said, we see that right here in this passage. I mean, just remember what the evangelist John wrote. He wrote, God sent a man named John, different John who came to tell about the light and to lead people to have faith. John wasn't that light. He came only to tell people about the light. Now that's what the evangelist wrote. And I think it is crucially important that we remember that these verses point towards who is actually in control. You see, it's God that's in charge of the whole shooting match, not us. You see, it wasn't really about John's deciding to go out into the world. And it wasn't about John deciding to tell people about the truth. And it wasn't about John deciding to lead people to faith. No, it was about God sending John to do a job. And to do it, he gave John both the opportunity and the ability. You see, it wasn't ultimately about John. And frankly, and and if this bothers you, I'm sorry, frankly, it's not about us either. Instead, it's about God giving us this incredible gift. And I want you to think about how incredible this gift actually is. God has given us a message that can change the world one person at a time. And he sent us out in a world to share it. You see, he initiates the sharing because it's grounded in his intention. And if we want to focus on that gift, that's something we need to remember. That's the first thing we need to remember. And second, along with remembering what God intends, we also need to remember why we're here. And I'm talking about why we're wherever we happen to be right now. In other words, we need to be clear about our purpose. A clarity that John the Baptist certainly had when this happened. The Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and temple helpers to ask John who he was. They told him plainly, I am not the uh, the Messiah. Then when they asked him if he were Elijah, he said, no, I'm not. When they asked him if he was the prophet, he said, no. Finally, they said, who are you then? We have to give an answer to the ones who sent us. Tell us who you are. John answered in the words of the prophet Isaiah, I am only someone shouting in a desert. Get the road ready for the Lord. You see, John knew exactly why he was there. He knew exactly why he was there. Around the Jordan River. And I'll tell you, it had nothing to do with his dashing good looks, or his irresistible charm, or his unique diet, or his ability to shape a crowd-pleasing message. Remember what his his job was? His job was to prepare the way. Just like that's our job. Our job to help folks around us focus on that same way. The one we know to be also the truth of the life. And this is something we can do when we decide to keep both our egos and our eloquence in check and simply to allow the light to shine through our actions and our attitudes and our words. I'll tell you, if we want to focus on the gift that God gives rather than on ourselves, we can remember why we're here. And third, I believe it's crucially important for us to remember whom we share. And deep down, I think we all know, right? We all know who we share in us. And I'll tell you, John the Baptist knew it too. 
Just listen to the evangelist John. Some Pharisees had also been sent to John. They asked him, why are you baptizing people if you are not the Messiah or Elijah or the prophet? John told them, I use water to baptize people. But here with you is someone you don't know. Even though I came first, I'm not good enough to untie his sandals. John said this as he was baptizing east of the Jordan River in Bethany. I'll tell you, John the Baptist remembered something we often forget. When it comes to witness bearing and savior following, it's not about us. Instead, it's about the light and it's about the word. You see, it's about how the light keeps shining in the dark and the darkness has never put it out. And how the true light that shines on everyone has come into the world. And it's about how the word was with God and was truly God. From the very beginning, the word was with God. And how with this word, God created all things. Nothing was made without the word. But it's also about how the word was in the world, but no one knew him. Though God had made the world through his word. He came to his own world, but his own nation didn't welcome him. Yet some people accepted him and put their faith in him. So he gave them the right to be the children of God. And I'll tell you, it's about how the word became a human being and lived here with us. And how because of that, we saw his true glory, the glory of the only son of the father, and how from him all kindness and all the truth God has, has, has come down to us. You see, that's the one to whom we bear witness. That's the one. He's the bread of life. He's the light of the world. He's a good shepherd. He's the way, the truth, and the life. That's the gift we've been given. And brothers and sisters, that's the gift we have to share. And personally, I believe we share it best when we obey his command. Later in, in the gospel, Jesus will say, but I am giving you a new command. You must love each other just as I have loved you. If you love each other, everyone will know you're my disciples. You see, John the Baptist knew the one he was sharing. And so can we. And along with what God intends and why we're here, this we can also remember. And I'll tell you, when we do, when we remember that God has given us the ability and the opportunity to share the good news, in other words, when we resist the temptation to focus our attention on ourselves rather than the gift, something amazing happens. And I'm going to tell you something really good. Something amazing happens to us. I'm telling you, when we do that, we are changed. Do you believe it? We are changed. For example, no longer will it be about what we do, but rather what God wants us to do. And no longer will it be about us sweetening the message, you know, making it more palatable so it goes down easy, but rather on us simply reflecting the light and trusting the word. And take it to the bank. No longer will it be about how magnificently we've succeeded or miserably we failed. But rather on humbly sharing Jesus Christ to the world around us. To our family, to our friends, to our community. And to do it as best we can. You see, we are changed when we focus on the gift. Now, remember at the beginning of the message... How I mentioned the song, I'll Be Home for Christmas. Do you remember that? Now, do you remember the last line to that song? I'll be home for Christmas if only in my dreams. Well, I'll tell you, COVID has made that more real than we could have ever imagined a year ago. And maybe that's why it's important for us to do as much as we can to celebrate the season as best we can. 
which means for me, remembering those wonderful gifts my dad, oh, I'm sorry, those wonderful gifts Santa would put in my stocking every year. Of course, I don't know if doing that changed my father. I, I don't know. But I can tell you, the way he was willing to step to the, to the side so that we could focus on the gifts rather on, than on him, well, that made a big difference to me. In fact, it even led me to preach a sermon about it. And for us, you know, maybe we could do the same kind of thing in our Christian lives. I mean, instead of assuming that it's, it's all about our decision and all about our message and all about our success, maybe we should take a step back and think about this passage and the example of John the Baptist. And then maybe, just maybe, we could simply remember what God intends and why we're here and whom we share. And you know, if we're able to do that, we'll be sharing a gift far more valuable than anything by the tree or found in a stocking. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord God, you, you've given us this wonderful example in your word of how to be a disciple, how to bear witness to you. And that example is John the Baptist. Remind us that you're the one that's in control, that you intend that message to go out and that you initiate the action. It's about you. And, and remind us that we are in a place, we are where we are, because you put us here to do your work. And Lord God, remind us of that wonderful gift that we have the opportunity to share. The word become, became flesh. The light shines in the darkness. Help us to, through our words and through our actions, through our lives, share your grace and your mercy and your love made real in Jesus Christ, Bethlehem's child. We ask this in the name of Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Now, before I give a charge or a blessing, I want to give you an invitation. You know, if there's anybody listening that feels the grace of God uh, and is interested in how he or she might respond, I want you to, to get my name. You can contact the church and they'll give you my name. I want to talk to you. If you've got a question about the sermon, or, or the service. I want you to contact the church. They'll get in touch with me. We can talk about that as well. Now, hear, hear the charge and the blessing. Brothers and sisters, as God's people, be challenged. Be challenged to go out and do the work God has given you to do. Because it's God's work. Help be challenged to claim the place where you are and the opportunities that you have. And be challenged during this Christmas season to focus your attention on the gift that was in the manger, Jesus Christ the Lord. And make him the center, not only of your witness, but also your life. And to inspire this walk, receive the blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Now, let's close the service with surely the presence of the Lord. Mm -hmm.